There's a storm across the valley The clouds are rolling in The afternoon is heavy on your shoulders There's a truck out on the four lane A mile or more away The whining of his wheel just makes it colder. Community Forum is sponsored by the Easton Grange 196 and a friend of Yardley Wood Rink and the Easton Lions Club. Welcome to Community Forum. Today is October 21st, 2024. I'm Priscilla Almquist Olson, your host, and today it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome Easton's land use and environmental planner, Jennifer Kalino. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And Jennifer has a very important job uh, in Easton uh, that relates and affects, impacts on all of you viewers out there, all of you residents of Easton and friends of Easton. So Jennifer, tell me a little bit about your job and um, how you got started on this journey. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the Land Use and Environmental Planner is basically the conservation agent for the town. And so I assist the Conservation Commission in their um, major role of administering and enforcing the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act and the town's local bylaw. I also help administer or uh, uh, Well, tell me. Yeah, the open, the open space, manage open space, yeah. uh, the town's <coughs> conservation property. Um, I um, certify vernal pools and look for endangered species. Okay, and also, um, I bet you, you have a lot, you know about invasive species, right? Correct. Yeah, and that's a, a real interest to many of us here um, in Easton. So the Conservation Commission is where your work is primarily uh, done. Uh, so. Um, the Conservation Commission deals with everything from invasive species to ver uh, vernal pools, uh, to open space, land use, uh, and who are the people that come before the board, the commission? Anyone looking to do work within 100 feet of a wetland or 200 feet of a river are required to get a permit from the Conservation Commission um, to review their project and make sure that everything complies with the state and local wetland laws. Um, How so many people uh, don't realize that they have to do this? I imagine there are uh, quite a few enforcement uh, issues too. They come before the board where people start doing things not knowing they have to uh, come before the board and get permission. Is that true? Uh, well, the law has been in place for more than 60 years, so um, you know, it is people's responsibility to make sure they're complying with state law. But yes, there are a number of, um, you know, there are, there are accidental violations for the most part. Usually people dumping compost or grass clippings or leaves in the wetlands themselves, that's a problem. Do you um, find people um, uh, filling in wetlands? Is that a major issue? Well, putting <coughs> leaves and your grass clippings is technically filling in a wetland. It's uh -huh. taking up all the space that would be used for flood storage. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't allow native plants to grow up and it impacts our wildlife habitat. Yeah, so tell me why are uh, Vernal pools, for example, why are they so important? Uh, it's an issue, I think, that uh, many of us are wondering about. We hear the term all the time. Now, um, Kyla Bennett, um, I invited her to, to show um, my uh, green team at the Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, of which I'm a member, to come and we have vernal pools in the, uh, on the 14 acre property of the Holy Trinity Lutheran Church on Lincoln Street. So she did a, gave us a tour and it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, but go, tell our viewers a little bit about vernal pools and why they're so important. Sure, vernal pools are <clears throat> some depressions in the landscape. Sometimes they're in the middle of a forest and sometimes they're in the middle of a wetland or a floodplain or near the river. They're the only breeding habitat for certain types of amphibians, and so it's really important to preserve those areas. The animals are only using vernal pools 
for a pretty short period of time and the rest of the time they're spending all of their life uh, migrating within the forest or living within the forest. And but uh, how many species are actually bred in fern vernal pools? I mean, that's an important reason for protecting them, right? Right. All, um, most of our frogs and toads in Massachusetts breed in vernal pools. Uh, some in ponds, but most of them um, use vernal pools. And all of our, well, not all of our salamanders, but most of our most of our salamanders. Now, um, the peepers, <laughs> is that what they call them? Uh, the peepers, that's, when we went out there with Kyla Bennett, um, Dr. Kyla Bennett, we, we heard all these peeping sounds and it was perfect so, so that she could explain to us what those little creatures were. Um, and, they, and why are they peeping? There are spring peepers. They're an actual tree frog, so they do have the little pads on their toes, so they can um, speak and we to saw your some. screens and, um, and trees. Yeah. Um, she took some out of the vernal pool, so we could see them. And yeah, but but what are they doing in there? Well, I'm trying to. Huh? I'm answering that. So, oh, so they ahead. yeah. They are uh, usually doing mating calls in the spring um, after the first warm rain, above 40 degrees, in usually March or April. That's mm -hmm. when they're making the breeding calls, and after that, sometimes after the rain, those are called rain calls. Uh huh. Right. So those are the breeding calls, and um, it's interesting because I think many people hear those peeping sounds uh, because vernal pools are uh, people don't usually know that they're there on, in, say, in the back of their property, uh, and then they hear these peeping sounds uh, during the, um, the the breeding the mating season. Um, and um, so, in terms of invasive species in Easton, what, what, what in your opinion, is the, the most, the, the biggest uh, um, problem, the biggest species that we have that creates, um, that's most invasive? <clears throat> well, in Easton, you have a number of invasive species. There's Japanese knotweed, Japanese barberry, oriental bittersweet, buckthorn, um, we also have aquatic invasive species in some of our ponds and rivers, mostly ponds, um, but those are milfoil and fanwort. Um, they well, take over and outcompete our native vegetation and they're less <clears throat> nutritious for our wildlife. Where can people get information about how to eradicate these invasive species um, and what they look like? Um, you know, an internet search would certainly do that. Mm -hmm. um, the Mass Invasive Plant uh, Working Group has uh, quite a bit of information. Mm -hmm. um, people should also know that if they're within the buffer zone or a wetland resource area, even to remove invasive species, you do need to obtain a wetland permit to do that work. I see. Okay. <clears throat> so that's interesting. Uh, I have that Japanese uh, knotwood called Japanese bamboo, I think, also. It looks like bamboo, and it's it's terrible. Um, and it comes from the um, Easton, uh, an easement fr uh, from the town of Easton, uh, at the end of my street, and it's gone on my property, and it just keeps moving, and it's taking up my lawn. Uh, it's going into the NRT property. Uh, I'm on the end of Seaver. It's just awful, and I read that it's very difficult to eradicate it. Um, and I've asked the, the uh, town, the GPW, to uh, take care, get rid of their knotweed so it doesn't continue on, and they can get rid of my, the, what is, the propagation of it too, but it hasn't happened. Is the Con uh, Conservation Commission have any power over that? Over another department? No. No, but I mean, uh, they, they, they have no means of eradicating it. Um. If it's on conservation property, uh, that is something the, the commission would look at, but it does take time and resources and funding in order to do that. Right. Um, I've just received uh, funding from the EPA oh. to take care of some of the invasive species that are next to Old Pond oh. and Old Pond Dam, so the all the burning bush um, oh, that yeah. should not be there. That's an exotic <coughs> invasive plant as well. Uh -huh. um, so we'll be working with a contractor and Old Colony Planning Council and so, the um, EPA to eradicate and replant the 
the, the area between Old Pond and the Bay Circuit Trail. I see. And then, so that would be conservation property? It is conservation yeah. property. Yeah. Okay. So the NRT has the, I don't think they know it. Maybe I should let them know they have uh, Japanese knotweed on their property because uh, it came from the town's easement you know, at the end of the road. and uh, It comes from lots uh, of places. It takes a coordinated effort to remove it. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been reading about it online and uh, um, it seems the best time is when it dies to get rid of it, right? It depends on which method you're choosing oh, yeah. for treatment and <clears throat> um, for the right time of year and the stage within the plant's life cycle. Mm -hmm. But I also read that it takes three years or more. It could take many years, yes. Yeah, it's a terrible thing. Very invasive, terrible. Okay, so um, uh, the Conservation Commission uh, has you there by its side at every meeting, right? And they always, always must be asking you for information, and you're so uh, well, well versed in all of these regulations. So tell me a little bit how you got started um, when you went, to, you went to school. I'm sure you majored in, what did you major in? I went to Bridgewater State, and I majored in environmental geography, and I had an art minor. Oh. Um, after college, I went into the Peace Corps, and I was an agricultural volunteer. At Where'd you go? Uh, West Africa. I really? Went to a country called Guinea-Bissau and assisted with agricultural women's projects, and How dry season gardening. Oh, a feminist like me. Good woman, good woman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I almost went to the Peace Corps, um, but I, I became an activist in the 60s. I'm dated. Um, but a lot of those the activists um, programs that I was involved in have resulted in people in your age bracket having all kinds of um, rights and freedoms that uh, we didn't enjoy. Mm -hmm. So, but what did you learn in Africa? What, what sorts of uh, things did you, were you involved in and what did you take from that experience? Um, <laughs> I mean, I learned a lot of gratitude for all of the you know, things that we have available to us in the U.S., and especially things like basic water, um, the, the ability to have food um, for many people, including many people in the U.S. and even in our own region. Um, you know, food security mm -hmm. is a, a difficult topic. Um, and what an experience. Are you there for two years? A yeah, little over two years. What language were they speaking? I learned to speak Kular and Kriolu. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. So English was not a common language. English was not spoken no. at all. At all. Okay. Sounds great. And how did uh, you, did you get to choose that place? Or did they look at your resume and say, oh, this woman, uh, this Carlino woman, mm -hmm. she is going to be great in this area. This is what we need here. I made it an open assignment and just to put me wherever I was needed. So um, I'm very excited to go to West Africa and got to travel around a little bit as well. So. Yeah. Um, uh, I've been to East Africa and uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda uh, many years ago. Uh, and uh, things were quite different. It was the, the year that um, Idi Amin kicked out all the Indians who had been four or five generations. Um, and. Um, yeah, I, I stared. Uh, I was at the, there was a, a guy at the border. We were crossing the border and some machine gun on a little tripod and six of us were, and he had his finger on the trigger and I started singing. I was only 28 and I <laughs> started singing, put a smile on your face. And instead of pulling the trigger, he did smile. Nice. <laughs> and things, but it, it can be tricky. Uh, depending where you are in Africa and what the political situation is. So did you come across any uh, political problems while you were there? Mm. So it was a peaceful country. Uh, I mean, for the most part, yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, after Bridgewater State and then after Peace Corps, um, what did you do? Uh, then I became the assistant conservation agent for the town of Bilreka. Oh. And I was there about a year and a half. I moved to Norton where I was, or moved job, and became the mm -hmm. conservation director for the town of Norton, and I was there for 22 years. No. Yeah. 22. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah. People always said you look young for your age. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so when did you come to Easton? About three years ago. Uh -huh. A little over three. Yeah. And what attracted you to Easton? Um, I like the opportunity to work in a little bit bigger department. Um, there was a lot of environmental uh, conservation and activism here, and so that was a good fit. Yeah. Have you found that, uh, for the most part, Eastern residents are really conservation activists and preservationists and care about the environment for the most part? Yes, yeah. from, what I've, from what I've seen and from you know, what people are saying and, and doing, yes. Yeah. So tell me, what is, uh, can you tell me some highlights of your three years here? Um, if you were to pick a few, uh, you don't have to mention names, but um, things that you're very proud of. Um, we've been working on an, a number of projects. So the Sam Wright Field project was uh, begun before I got here, uh, where they removed the buildings. And we're about to go into permitting for the removal of the culvert and wetland and floodplain restoration. Um, invasive species management and land management for that property. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's pretty exciting to get through through that. We're partnering with uh, the Nature Conservancy on the funding, and we had previously received um, MVP grant funding as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, that's a pretty broad spectrum of issues. Yes. Uh, and they're all happening at the same time? Big project, same project, <laughs> same property. Um, we're applying for some uh, grant funding from CPC, and I actually have a site walk with a grant authority today to preserve some land on Chestnut Street, which is important. So it will actually be between two towns. It'll be Mansfield and Easton. Oh. Um, both conservation commissions are working jointly on this project, and will create a corridor between two towns. And if we are approved for a CPC grant, um, Easton would be purchasing about 18 acres, but it would join 74 acres. So oh my it's goodness. a really, um, it's a really good um, keystone piece to. Wow, and so you, this will be a partnership with Correct, yeah. Mansfield. Uh, and how will the property be utilized in the future? Uh, mostly trails, forestry, wildlife habitat, um, passive recreation. So there's a difference between. Uh, most people don't know this, they use this interchangeably. Conservation land is different than wetland. Conservation land means the Conservation Commission owns the property and has title to it. Wetlands are a physical feature that's protected by different laws. Mm -hmm. um, Conservation Commission can engage in passive recreation activities, so hiking, dog walking, canoeing, kayaking, nothing that has a motorized a component to it, like a uh, motorized boating, would be an active recreation um, type mm -hmm. of project. So, so is it, there's a pond on the 74 acres? No, no, just giving examples of... Oh, oh I see what you're saying, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Mansfield seems to have the same um, uh, focus and uh, mission as Eastern. Is that what you found out? Uh, yes, for the most part, working yeah. with my colleague, Caitlin. Um, mm -hmm. We both have similar um, views and understanding of landscape, ecology, and mm -hmm. conservation. And having large blocks and making them connected is really important for our native wildlife. Mm. Um, yeah, and um, I know Easton has a lot of corridors, uh, which are important uh, because uh, we don't see d uh, dead deer on the road anymore for the most part. It's very rare in Easton that I see one. We, we do have a lot of deer. We have more than what's recommended for the average deer per acre. Mm -hmm. um, so but, that is uh, something that needs to be managed. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's also um, deer, because you've made the corridors, they don't have to cross roads. And they, for the most part, right? Well, no, they they have to cross roads. They do have to cross, yeah. but but it's fewer now than it used to be. No, well, I, I you have more roads. Yeah, yeah. Well. They they have to cross just as many roads. They do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, <laughs> we we don't have big enough blocks in in uh, this area to support uh -huh. a deer's territory without crossing roads. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, deer, deer seem to, they don't really wander or roam that much, do they? Once they find a, 
a good wooded forested area, they they more or less stay there, right? Well, they they move pretty far, and they are uh, they do pretty much eat the entire understory. Most of our forests are not very healthy because the, there's an overgrazing, overbrowsing by deer. Oh, um, that also invites the invasive species that you brought up earlier oh, right. in our discussion today. So managing deer helps our native plant life come back to life so that we have different ages and different sizes and different species variety of plant within our forest. Mm -hmm. And if you look out and you just see large trees and you know almost no shrubs or oh. different size trees, then we know that the deer is um, overgrazing that area and um, it's not really a healthy forest. I see, okay. Um, so now, how many properties uh, are under the uh, ages of the Conservation Commission here in Easton. I'm actually updating the open space plan now and one of those requirements is to go through conservation property and make sure you have the correct deed and everything is recorded so that it is um, properly and permanently protected. So I'm just going through all of that right now trying to find um, appropriate maps and plans of all of the <coughs> conservation land. Uh, there's a number of parcels and the overall acreage of all protected land, including borderland and NRT mm. land, is somewhere around 2,500, uh, 3,000, I think. How many? Um, not finished with the numbers yet, but it looks like maybe 2,500 for acres. Acres for the yes. whole town, for all open space. Yeah. Now, uh, I was told that 38% of the town's land mass is in conservation. Would you say that's accurate? I'm not having finished the, oh. <laughs> the, ma the not having finished the matrix and, and mm -hmm. finished the numbers. Um, I, okay. I, I don't know for sure, but um, I've told that to tuned. a lot of people because <laughs> <laughs> I'm really proud of that. Uh, I think Easton should be really proud of that. Yes, that would get to uh, you know, the state's climate goals of sorry. Now, tell me something. 30 by 30 protected and 50 oh. by 50 um, important climate goals. And now, do you often you get... You are running out of time. Do you, uh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Do you often get um, applications from people who want to donate their property to the Conservation Commission's um, overview authority, shall we say? We do. Um, it's a great way to preserve your family's property, um, maintain some wildlife habitat, including uh, different types of communities. So if you have a field or a forest or um, successional habitat is all really important. There is a tax incentive um, for people who donate property. Uh, the big thing is the all the taxes do need to be paid in order for the town to accept property, but we're happy to take a look at it and evaluate land and mm -hmm. see if it, you know, pieces the puzzles, you know, pieces all the, um, puts all the pieces together for large um, blocks that are great for mm. habitat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so one of those properties, uh, the, uh, the commission, ha uh, conservation commission has been. Um, looking after for many years is the Tufts Farm. Mm -hmm. And that um, is a property that the Conservation Commission leases. So, um, and it's changed uh, its uh, uh, use over the years. Um, and currently, uh, you want to talk about that now, what it currently is still a lease? Sure. Um, Tufts Farm has been a leased farm for a number of decades. It's been farmland for um, we'll say at least 100 years, mm. right? And it's, uh, oh, yeah, at it's least. deep in, in farm, more, farm more than, history. Mm, more um, than 100. Previously, um, uh, it had mostly been uh, mowed fields. And currently, we have a, a great tenant who's really taken um, good care of our property and helped remove, uh, let's say, a lot of of waste and trash that had been collecting on the property, mm -hmm. um, getting the fields back in order by utilizing sheep and um, hopefully raising some sheep this this winter and spring. Um, but yes, our, our tenant is doing a fantastic job renovating that property. Um, is, oh, that's good to hear. I'll say two more things about Tufts Farm. 
I'm sorry, what? Two more things about Tufts Farm. Oh, okay. Um, current, one of the Conservation Commission's projects this fall is to install a small parking lot of maybe five cars so that residents have a place to park. There'll be a trail that will go around the property and get you to Flyaway Pond. So there'll be a nice connection there, a small area to park. Eventually, um, oh, that's the, great. the farmer will have some um, products to sell. You'll be able to purchase them there. Nice. Yes, so that is working wow. in the works right now. Um, My goodness. And um, Water Course is yeah. donating uh, quite and, a bit and so of the, walk the work to, to the flyaway the, won't be very long then. Well, any walk will be as long as you make it. Yeah, right. But, um, we would just want to make the plug for Water Course Solutions. They are donating a lot of time and energy to create that parking lot. Who is doing it? Uh, Water Course. I see. Okay, great. Yeah. Now, um, um, and then the la last thing, so there are two things. The last yeah. thing is we uh, do have a request for CPC funds to help restore the farmhouse and the barn and the workshop. And so hopefully we'll have some support for that. Great. It's an important <clears throat> historical area mm -hmm. in town and um, town mm -hmm. buildings. They do need maintenance over time and we'll be, you know, hopefully garnering some support for that. So thank you. Yeah. So it's going to be a wonderful resource for Eastern yes. residents. Yes. You know, um, I was in Sweden uh, this, I go every other year to visit family. And I was there in August, and um, my uh, stayed with my cousin's son Horkan and his wife Solve, and they have uh, they raise sheep. Um, he he's also a <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, he in, has a business he's had for many years installing solar panels, and all over the island uh, that they live on, and you know on the mainland also. So I I said, what a great idea! You've got the sheep. You have all the solar connections. <laughs> and he said, and they wrote back and said, that's not a new idea. That's, that's been, we're not in the business of doing that, um, but we know it's, it's happening all over Sweden. He says, oh, what do you know? So it's not, it's not really a, an American idea, but it is very unique and uh, new for us here in Easton. Uh, and I know Chronicle did a part, um, a whole series on um, Mr. Finnegan's farm and, and what he's doing uh, for the uh, solar parks. Uh, so are there other, other, how do people, uh, uh, do, do people make suggestions about properties that they know are uh, just lying vacant and open space um, and, and suggest that you look into it and ask the owners if they're interested in donating the property? Yes, um, we are like I said, we're re updating the open space and recreation plan. We do have the survey that was just released on Friday. Uh -huh. And so if you go to the Conservation Commission's webpage and uh, take the survey, you can list properties you think should be preserved or types of land that you would like to see preserved or recreation programs that you would like um, to be available uh, to Eastern residents. So it's a, an important document. Yeah. It enables the town to receive grant funding, and we can't receive grant funding without it. So mm -hmm. we will be doing some uh, public workshops as well. well. But the, the survey has started, so please fill it out. <laughs> so everybody out there, all the viewers, yeah. uh, listen up. And, and when you're driving around or walking around, uh, take a look at properties and uh, give the Conservation Commission a ring if you think there's something uh, some properties that would be wonderful to add to the conservation land in Easton. Thank you, Jennifer Carlino, land use and environmental planner, yeah. for this very interesting and th uh, thorough, detailed, comprehensive uh, information about what you're doing and what the Town Conservation Commission is providing for Easton residents. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Thank you again. And to viewers out there, until next time, this is Priscilla Almquist-Olson bidding you farewell. <laughs>